It's always a joy for me to be in a unity church because I often speak in moderate to liberal Christian churches as well as Unitarian Universalist churches. And most of those folk just don't quite have the heart, the, the, the joy, the passion. This reminds me sort of of my Pentecostal roots. Oh, the spirit! <laughs> Connie and I actually went out just the night before last and watched the movie Selma uh, about Martin Luther King Jr. See the movie. It's fabulous. It's absolutely fabulous. Very inspiring. Selma. Selma. I'd like to speak this morning on the subject of soulful science and realistic hope. Now, why is it that we even need to put the word soulful in front of science? Why don't people experience science in a soulful way in the first place? How is it that so many people can think of science as merely secular, merely, you know, the dry facts and evidence and all that non-spiritual, you know, boring stuff? How much? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons, but I think one of them is that in the Western world, we've been wrong about God's presence and God's word for several hundred years. So we haven't been aware of the fact that God, that is reality with a personality, and I just want to be clear, if you want to stump any of your humanist and atheist friends or family or co-workers, people who say, ah, I don't believe in God, God doesn't exist, I'm going to give you a way to leave them dead in the tracks, just as like sort of speechless. They won't be able to respond to you. And I can sum it up with one word that I think is the single most important scientific discovery about religion in the last hundred years. The word is personification. See, if you think of Uncle Sam as the spirit of the U.S. government or the god of the government, people can say, I don't believe in that. But if you realize that Uncle Sam is a personification of the government, then it doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not. The government's real. <laughs> Poseidon was not the god of the oceans. Poseidon was not the spirit of the oceans. Poseidon was a personification of the incomprehensibly powerful and capricious seas. If you're at the ocean, which you're pretty close right here, right? It doesn't matter whether you believe in Poseidon or not. Poseidon is inescapably real. Whether you choose to personify it or not is another matter, but the oceans are real. Helios, this great ball of flame and light that gives us life. You didn't find atheists two or three thousand years ago saying, I don't believe in Helios. <laughs> Whatever you mean by this is what I'm talking about. Eros was a personification of what we call love or lust. It doesn't matter whether you believe in Eros or not. If you're alive, you've probably experienced lust. <laughs> and one of the reasons why the ancients talked about the immortality of the gods is because humans are born and humans die. Humans come and humans go. Lust is always there. <laughs> Poseidon is always there. Helios is always there. Gaia. Gaia was not the goddess of the earth. Gaia was not the spirit of the earth. Gaia was a personification of what we today call the earth, little e. See, they had an I-thou relationship to what we often have an I-it relationship to. And something's lost. The famous Jewish theologian Martin Buber wrote one of his most famous books called I and Thou. He talked about the radical difference between an I-it relationship and an I-thou relationship. And what he said was that if we continue to relate to nature as an it that we think we can use for and exploit for our benefit, we will cause our own extinction. We need to relate to nature as a thou to be honored and respected. We need to relate to all aspects of reality. So when you think of, or when you think, when you basically, some of your people who are like, don't believe, you don't have to believe. We can now know God has been revealing reality. Again, I'm using the word God as reality with a personality, not a person outside reality. And reality is an inescapably real. In fact, sometimes people will say to me, well, Michael, you know, the, the, especially the philosophical types, the young male, usually philosophical tribes that try to get you, right? Well, what do you mean by reality? I love Philip K. Dick's definition. He said, reality is that which when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, 
And I'll be doing the whole bunch on, is it Monday night? Monday night here? Yeah. I'll be doing the whole bunch on Monday night in terms of going more deeply into this. But I just want to give just a little taste right now. So what I'm talking about, when I'm using the word God, I'm speaking about a sacred name, a personification of what's undeniably, inescapably real. And all religions, if they were doing their job, help people and help societies live in right relationship to reality. In fact, there was a book, a famous book, written by one of the leading philosophers of religion alive today, Loyal Rue. He wrote a book called Religion is Not About God. And what he means is that religion is about our relationship to reality. And yes, reality has been personified as the various gods and goddesses. But if religion's doing its job, it helps us live in right relationship to what's inescapably real. So why is it that we have been toxifying the air, the water, the soil? Why is it that we're pumping heat-trapping gases into the atmosphere so fast that we're causing a, 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 a runaway situation? In the Arctic, for example, it's a runaway meltdown situation. This is scary stuff. How do we hold this scary stuff in ways that don't just freak us out, that don't just depress us, but inspire us to work together with people of different belief systems to do what we can to help ensure a healthy future? That's what I want to speak about just briefly this morning, and that's what I want to go into a whole lot more about on tomorrow night. So the soulful science is recognizing that every fact that we discover, okay, every, every scientist, anywhere in the world, Buddhist scientist, atheist scientist, doesn't matter, whatever the person's religion, doesn't matter, if they're studying some aspect of reality and coming to, to know some fact that we can all agree on, that is simultaneously something we discover, but it's also reality revealing truth. It's God's word. It's God's evidential word. And one of the genius things of, of the Fillmores and Ernest Holmes and some of the other new thought thinkers over 100 years ago was the idea that reality isn't just material, but that our thoughts impact how we experience reality. But sometimes people mistake what new thought is all about. They think that they sort of have a magical view, that if I just have the right thoughts, everything's going to go great for me. That's not what new thought's about. What new thought's about is whatever is real we can stay inspired to be in action through our thoughts. It doesn't, it's not some magical ticket that, you know, everything's going to always go well for us. If we interpret it that way, we're sometimes going to get frustrated. We're sometimes going to run into a wall and wonder, wow, wait a second, I must have had the wrong thoughts. And then we start judging ourselves for not having the right thoughts. That's not what new thought's about. It's saying whatever God, whatever reality is doing, I can, if I stay in touch with my heart and stay aware of the facts that my thoughts co-create my experience of reality, I can stay inspired not only to be in action, but to be a blessing. So I can be a blessing to others. And that's when we truly are Christians, Christ-like. We are saviors of each other and saviors of the future. We are blessings to each other and blessings to the future. Soul, by soulful science, what I'm speaking about is honoring facts as God's native tongue. Evidence as modern day scripture. And of course, what we know in New Thought, but many of your neighbors don't know, is that God doesn't, any God that is imagined to only exist outside nature or outside time is trivial compared to a God who transcends and includes nature. A God who transcends and includes time. In fact, the way I've sometimes spoken about it now is that God has been hiding in time all along and we're just now waking up to that fact. See, as a evolutionary Christian, as a Christian uh, mystic, uh, an evidential mystic, for me, the Trinity, just to use one example, is not three persons who live outside the universe somewhere. The Trinity is a personification of past, the Creator, first person of the Trinity. The Creator personified, 13.8 billion years of creativity personified. See, the Creator's real. There has been 13.8. In fact, that's what this is. This is my cosmic rosary. I grew up Catholic. You can't get the Catholic out of me, right? This is my cosmic rosary. I've got 269 of the major transformational moments in the history of the universe represented in beads. My first bead is all the different names. All these little diamonds are not real diamonds, obviously. But, uh, you know, all the different names for reality. 
These are different names for God or ultimacy. And then the beginning, the Big Bang, or what, what scientists call the Big Bang. Connie and I don't call the beginning of the universe Big Bang. Because think about it. The beginning of everyone and everything? The Big Bang? Like, what does that make us? Shrapnel? <laughs> So we call it the Great Radiance. I think it's a far more majestic way of thinking of the Great Radiance. And then the formation of the early galaxies and then the Milky Way galaxy and on. I go through all the way through until the major discoveries that have helped us to come to understand this as our sacred story. This is our modern day Genesis. Not something written two or three thousand years ago and frozen in time in a book. This is our modern day Genesis. In fact, one of the things I'll talk a little bit more about tomorrow night is sort of my creed. That, and it's not just my creed. This perspective is uniting tens of millions of secular and religious people around the world. Reality is my God. Evidence is my scripture. Big history is my creation story. Ecology is my theology. Integrity is my spiritual path. And doing what I can to ensure a just and healthy future is my mission. Let me say that a little bit slower. Reality is my God and evidence is my scripture. Big history is my creation story and ecology is my theology. Integrity is my spiritual path. And what I mean by integrity are the practices, the exercises that help us live in right relationship to reality. So integrity is my spiritual path and ensuring a just and healthy future or doing everything I can to ensure a just and healthy future is my mission. I'm suggesting that these six core agreements unite tens of millions of secular and religious people around the world. In fact, I sometimes say when I, this always throws Christians a little, you know, a little loop. I'll say, I'll, you know, get up behind a pulpit with, you know, my jacket and I'll look all, you know. This morning's scripture reading is from cosmologist Carl Sagan. <laughs> and then I quote this. How is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded, this is better than we thought? The universe is much bigger than our prophet said, grander, subtler, more elegant. God must be even greater than we dreamed. A religion, this is still a quote from Carl Sagan, a religion old or new that stressed the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. Sooner or later, he said, such a religion will emerge. Now, I believe Carl Sagan was correct in the intuition and dead wrong in the detail. Because it's not a religion that's emerging, it's a set of values, priorities, and commitments that are not about beliefs, but about knowledge that we can all agree on. Because it's revealed evidentially. And it's all about one main thing, living in right relationship to the future. Everything at this point can be boiled down to, is it anti-future or pro-future? Because all the behaviors and actions that we would do to be pro-future are going to be the things that would be considered Christ-like or godly or spiritual anyway. And the things that we would do that would be anti-future, that would betray the future, harm the future, destroy the future, are things that are the opposite of what the gospel is about, the opposite of what spiritual principles are about. Thomas Berry, my great mentor, he died at the age of 94. He was kind of the Pierre Terre de Chardin of, 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 of my lifetime. He called himself a geologian. <laughs> Not a theologian, a geologian. Kind of a, kind of a theologian of the earth, right? He was a Catholic priest. He said that our predicament and our way into the future can be summed up in three sentences. The first sentence is that in the 20th century and early 21st century, the glory of the human has become the desolation of the earth. What he means is that things have been getting better and better in many ways for humans. We're living longer lives, we're living more comfort, and so on for most people. And yet, it's at the expense of the natural world. The air, the water, the soil, and the life has been diminishing. You know, something like 95% of, of the fish are lost from what was here 300 years ago. 65% of the soil has been blown off, destroyed. We are impacting the natural world in ways that are catastrophic, and our children and grandchildren will definitely be catastrophic if we don't come into right relationship to reality, right relationship to God. 
So the glory, the first sentence, the glory of the human in the 20th century and early for 21st century, the glory of the human has become the desolation of the earth. Second, second sentence, the desolation of the earth is becoming the great shame of the human. Third sentence says it all. The third sentence is our way into the future. He says, therefore, all programs, policies, activities, and institutions, in other words, everything we do from now on, hence from, from this point on, must be judged primarily by the extent to which it inhibits, ignores, or fosters a mutually enhancing human-earth relationship. In other words, given sentences number one and two, Everything that we do from this point on, all of our policies, all of our laws, all of our economics, all of our theology, all of our doctrines, all of everything we do from now on must be judged by whether it's pro-future or anti-future, by whether it harms the future or helps the future. And the interesting thing is, God's been revealing some really exciting things. It's not a matter of believing. There are things that we know that Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, Jews, atheists can all agree on in terms of the things that will help us co-create a just and healthy future. Not just for humanity, but for the larger body of life upon which we all depend. There are things individually that we can do. There are things that congregationally we can do. There are things that nationally we can do. There are, it, it, it's not a matter of guesswork. Because when we realize that God's been speaking really clearly for 300 years through evidence, then we simply attend to what has God been revealing about our past so that we can align our laws, our medicine, our politics, our economics, our education with the way life works, with the way nature works, so that we can truly co-create. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that we can co-create a mutually enhancing human-earth relationship. It's like the shift from being a cancer in the body of life. See, oh, I did a program 20 some odd years ago where uh, there was a person, we opened it up, you know, I did like an hour long program and then somebody stood up and he said, why is it if we are the universe? See, here's the thing. When you realize this is our sacred story, you realize that we're not separate from nature. We are nature. The universe has been unfolding and expanding for 13.8 billion years and we are that process becoming conscious of itself. We didn't come into the world, we grew out of it. In the same way that apples grow out of an apple tree, humans grow out of the universe. We grow out of Earth. We are literally the universe after some 13.8 billion years of unbroken evolution now becoming conscious of itself. A human being looking through a telescope is the universe looking at itself and going, whoa. <laughs> A biology student looking at a mic through a microscope is the planet Earth learning with awareness, with consciousness, how it's functioned unconsciously and instinctually for billions of years. Brian Swim is a professor of cosmology. He's spoken at the National Unity uh, Gatherings. He says he's got these two quotes to just sort of help people nail it. He says, four billion years ago, Earth was molten rock, and now it sings opera. <laughs> Earth was once molten rock and now it sings opera. And nobody put anything here. When the Bible, like Genesis 2-7, talks about God forming us from the dust of the ground and breathing into us the breath of life, that's a true story. It's a mythic way, reality personified, took us out of the earth and gave us life. God is reality with a personality, not a person outside reality. So when we realize this, we realize that God's been giving, it's almost like we've been spiritually autistic for a few hundred years. Because of what I call, and I'll go into this more tomorrow night, what, the triple idolatries. Idolatry of the written word, idolatry of the otherworldly, and idolatry of beliefs. Idolatry of the written word, very simply, is when we think God's best guidance, that is our best map of reality, is frozen in any ancient text. Idolatry of the otherworldly is where we think where God resides is only outside time and nature. And idolatry of beliefs is when you think any one belief system is the only one right way to right relationship to reality. 
So these idolatries have kept us from seeing that God has been speaking really clearly to us through all forms of evidence. That's why I call myself an evidential mystic because evidence helps me live in right relationship to reality. My inner reality, my outer reality, my social reality, and my interpretive reality, which is where new thought, that's one of our great strengths. So let me just wind down. Soulful science, and I mentioned the second half, realistic hope. Now, anybody who's awake today, if we're not sleeping, if, our, if, our, if, the, if we get our information about what's real in the world through something other than just Fox News, <laughs> and I'm not just picking on Fox News, I could pick on other TV stations as well, but Fox News seems to specialize in some of that. If we're half awake today, there are plenty of things that we can get overwhelmed by, depressed by, fearful about, especially when we think at our, of, of our children and our grandchildren. When we think of the fact that it's quite likely in the next several decades that California, millions and millions of people will migrate out of California because they're running out of water. There's lots of scary stuff. How do we stay inspired? Well, I can say the good news, the gospel, According to science, the good news about climate change, I can say it in five words. We can see it coming. Yeah. We can see it coming. Never before in the history of the entire world, not just humanity, in the history of the entire world, has any species been able to see a potential extinction level event coming in time to ward off the worst and to prepare for what's already baked in the system. That's really good. But the other thing that's good news is that God isn't just all about back there, up there, or someday. God is as present now as any time in human history. And God is incarnate in time, nature, and mystery. Those are the three things that I think are inescapably real, whether we believe in them or not. The past is real, whether we believe it or not. Clearly, if we act as if the future is not real, we will condemn the future. And of course, the only place we can experience the past to honor the past and be a blessing to the future is in the present moment. But that doesn't make the past and the future not real. So the time is real, whether we believe it or not. Nature is real, whether we believe it or not. But so is mystery. And by mystery, I mean I include what we call the transcendence, but it's not just the realm that we don't know. It's the entire realm that we don't even know that we don't know. <laughs> so what does it mean to live in right relationship with time, nature, and mystery? Well, the exciting thing is God has never been more present than now. Reality is revealing itself right now in ways that are just as real as any time in human history, including when Jesus walked or when the Fillmores walked or anybody else. That's good news. But also, God's guidance isn't merely in the past. And as much as I value the Fillmore's writings and, uh, and, and the Bible and so many other things, we, we, we need to attend to what is God revealing today through all forms of evidence that inspires us to work together, that inspires us to forgive each other because we're all human. I do a whole program, I'm not going to get into it much tomorrow night, but I do a whole program on evolutionary psychology and brain science. What has God been revealing through science, through evidence, that helps us live better lives and have healthier relationships? I mean, this is not just a problem for young men, it's also a problem for some women as well, but it's many more young men are struggling with this around the world than women. Any young man who, for example, thinks that the reason he's being tempted by internet pornography is because his great, 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 great grandmother ate an apple <laughs> is going to be utterly clueless about how to live in integrity. In fact, I did my, the first TED talk that I ever delivered in Grand Rapids, Michigan was on evolutionary psychology and brain science. I had three evangelicals come up to me after my program, and all three of them, within a two and a half hour period, all three of them said basically the same thing, which was, I used to be a young earth creationist until I heard your program. Now I've got to accept evolution, I've just got to do it in a God-honoring way. That young, one young man, he, I, I think he was probably in his mid-twenties, he said, I always thought that evolution was about Darwin, DNA, and dinosaurs. I didn't know it was about how to live a more Christ-like life and have healthier relationships. So recognizing that God is present in time and nature as well as mystery. God is incarnate. Then, 
we can also be a blessing to the future. We can serve the future and know that in doing so, we are being Christians, Christ-like. We are, we are doing that. And again, I'll go into a lot more of this tomorrow night. If you know that you can't be here tomorrow night, you've already got a commitment. As you can tell, I'm pretty evangelistic about this perspective. <laughs> In fact, one, one evangelical was trying to criticize me. He gave me what I call a great compliment. He said, doubt is like a cross between Carl Sagan and a Pentecostal preacher. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> that works for me. But if you know that you can't be here tomorrow night, we have three DVDs that we give you the rights to burn copies. You can make as many copies of our DVDs. But the main thing is we now have a thumb drive, a little flash drive that has 22 of our videos, sermons and longer programs. In fact, the program that I'm doing tomorrow night, if you can't be here tomorrow night, that exact program is also on that thumb drive. And so it's, it's actually 15 hours of our video programs. And many people don't know how to make copies. So if you don't know how to burn a DVD to make copies, anybody can loan somebody a thumb drive. They drag and drop it to their computer, loan it to somebody else. So it's a great way. You can share this perspective with dozens of your friends and neighbors and relatives very, very inexpensively if you get the thumb drive. So if you know you can't be here tomorrow night, that's what I suggest. I'll close with my favorite one-line piece of scripture from Carl Sagan. <laughs> Science is at least in part informed worship. Science is at least in part informed worship. Thank you.